After recovering from COVID-19, what are your chances of getting it again? That's what we're gonna dive into today on A Taste of Medicine. When we're talking about reinfection of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, what we're talking about is that you catch the virus, you recover, and you catch it again. A 25-year-old man from Nevada was the first American who was confirmed to be reinfected with SARS-CoV-2. The Lancet published this article back in October 2020 talking about his specific case. Not only was he young at 25, he also had really no other medical issues and otherwise had a healthy immune system. So as you can see in figure one, his initial symptoms began on March 25th of 2020 and then was tested positive on April 18th. He had symptom resolution the following week and was subsequently tested negative twice for the virus, both on May 9th and May 26th. He began to feel unwell again shortly thereafter on May 28th and had another positive PCR test June 5th. Fortunately, both of his positive tests were analyzed for their genetic sequence, and it was confirmed that they were different. Figure 3 of this journal goes over the phylogenetic placement of uh, both species. <laughs> I'm not a virologist, but what this graph is showing us is every sample that was taken from uh, 171 positive cases in Nevada up at that point, as well as the original strain, which was released by Chinese scientists shortly after the virus was discovered in Wuhan, China, and another case that was uh, genetically identified in Seattle, Washington. Now there's an important distinction that we need to make. A lot of the mutations that we're talking about, whether it's the UK variant, the Brazilian variant, or the South African variant, specifically deal with the spike protein. And the reason that we care so much about the spike protein, again, if you've watched my other videos, is that's the key, the way uh, that the virus is able to gain access to your cells. And that's the target of the first couple of vaccines that we've seen. We want to make sure that our immune system can recognize that spike protein, attack the virus before it has a chance to replicate thoroughly in our system and, and cause a lot of damage. All right, so this is important to know and recognize and think about, but it's also important to recognize this is one case. So a lot of times what we'll say in uh, science or in medicine is anecdotally, right? This is a singular case and it was published because we had a lot of information about it and we weren't sure if this was going to be a significant problem uh, that we would see across the world as uh, multiple people getting reinfected all the time. And while it's horrible for that one person, it might be really unusual. And so we need to do studies to look at larger groups of populations and figure out, well, how likely is this to happen? One of the most important variables or aspects of a trial or study is how many people are enrolled. The more people you get in that study, the more confident you can become that the results aren't just due to chance, but really because of that's how it actually is. Now imagine that this guy was one of 10 people enrolled in a study. The study might come out and say, well, 10% of people are reinfected, but we need hundreds and thousands of people in these studies to get a sense of the real world impact of this amongst a much larger population. Ask and ye shall receive. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the SIREN study. The SIREN study looked at this very question. So UK researchers uh, went to healthcare workers and between June and November of 2020, they enrolled 20,000 healthcare workers to look at this very issue. So how they set the study up is they took everyone who enrolled and then tested them, both for the virus itself with a PCR test and for evidence of previous infection with an antibody test. In the positive cohort, you had people that had either tested positive for COVID-19 before or, or were antibody positive for it. And then the negative cohort, people who either hadn't had symptoms or hadn't tested positive 
and then their antibody test was also negative. They got tested every two to four weeks, both looking for the virus itself and antibodies to the virus. And they completed questionnaires asking about symptoms as well as exposures. So in the negative cohort, there were about 14,000 people and they found 318 infections over that study period of five months. In the positive cohort, people who had already tested positive for the virus or who had the antibody, they found 44 possible or probable infections over the same time period, the five months. So the authors analyzed the data and found that if you were in the positive cohort, if you had had COVID before, you were 83% less likely to get the infection than if you were in the negative cohort, if you had never had the infection before. So that's good. Having had the infection before is likely going to provide you a degree of immunity for at least five months. So an important thing to recognize about this study is who participated in it. And it was predominantly female with over 80%, predominantly white, over 80%, and the average age was 45. So a question you always have to ask yourself is, is this generalizable to different populations? Would the results be different for men, for different ethnic groups? My guess is probably not, but we don't know for sure. Age though, I do worry about age. As we've covered, age is so important um, with the older you are, the worse you tend to do. And we've seen other markers that the immune response from younger people with having more symptoms after vaccines uh, compared to older groups. So I do wonder about immune duration of elderly patients and wondering if their duration of immunity might be less. Another important thing to note is the average time to being reinfected was 160 days. So just over that five month stretch. Another interesting aspect is that of the reinfected patients, only about a third were symptomatic or had symptoms of COVID when they were diagnosed. Remember, these people were just getting routinely tested every two to four weeks because the authors wanted to know if these people were getting infected. Now compare that to people who started out in the negative cohort and got their first infection with COVID, 80% were having symptoms when they were diagnosed. But how I'm interpreting this is that those who get reinfected tend to be much milder than first time infections. But this doesn't mean you can just go running around without a mask. <laughs> and the reason is because they still found the virus, you know, and they made the comment on two of the um, probable infections that they had high viral load. And so sure, those patients probably were either asymptomatic or mild disease, um, but they are still likely going to be spreading it. And so when we talk about transmission or how easy it is for you to give that virus to somebody else, if we can see one of the vaccines reduces your rates of transmitting it to someone else, it's going to be huge. So a big question is, well, how long does the immunity last? And the authors are going to be continuing to follow these patients. And not only how long does the immunity last, but what are your chances of reinfection? You know, at a year, does it go down to 60%? At two years, 20%? We don't know. The authors were also quick to point out that they wanted to provide some of this interval data before B117 variant became widespread. So like I talked about in the last video on mutations, your immune system is predominantly going to be honing in on that spike protein, right? Whether you're recovering from a natural infection or you got one of the vaccines. And if that spike protein changes enough, it might be able to camouflage itself. So the concern is with some of these variants, even if you've had COVID before, you might not be protected from these new variants. So we learned that if you get COVID-19, you're significantly less likely to be reinfected than people who have never had the infection before. And that duration lasts for at least five months and hopefully we'll learn it continues for much longer, but we're just not there yet with the data, we don't know. And that even if you do get reinfected, only about a third of people, at least in this study, develop symptoms, comparing that to 80% of first-time infected COVID patients in this study who develop symptoms. 
But unfortunately, those who were reinfected continue to have high levels of virus and are still going to be a vector or someone who can transmit it to other people. But this study was primarily done before the UK variant was widespread. So how that changes any of this or how the Brazil or the South African variant change any of this remains to be seen. If you like this video and you're not friends with me on social media, subscribe. You'll get the notifications. I promise I'm going to be doing about one of these every one to two weeks, depending on life. And unless you're friends with me on social media, you probably won't see it. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time on A Taste of Medicine.